So we've been on this place since 1964. Um, my mother, who runs the cattle on this place, grew up upriver from here, so she's been along the banks of the James River her entire life. And my father was a farmer, rancher, and lineman, and we've been running cows on this place ever since. I like grasslands, I like cattle. I have never been a farmer at heart. We, I grew up on a ranch by the river. We've always had cattle and horses, and that's the way I like it. That's the way I want to stay. We used to raise some corn, but we planted all the land to grass. And if I want corn, I can buy it at the elevator. I've been in the wagon restoration business, uh, Holly and I have, since 1978. When the business matured and I kind of got involved more in the, uh, the management of the grassland, we picked up a few acres. I've uh, become more keenly interested in the restoration of the grassland. So these are all native prairies along the bluffs of the James River. And I guess <laughs> restoration is in my blood. And so the conservation and restoration of these horse-drawn vehicles now it's kind of switched to also the restoration and conservation of the, the native prairie. My father was a, a conservationist. He, he planted a lot of trees and he would, you know, was conscious about taking care of the land. My mother obviously has that too and, and that's been, uh, I guess, passed on to myself. Holly and I both uh, enjoy the beauty of the land and the, uh, the wildness of the land. And, it's, uh, it's a value to restore that to its native uh, state. And also on the, on the production side, as we gain uh, more native uh, grasses and forbs, we also see the production go up. So it's kind of a win-win. If you take the cattle off the land, it will become a monoculture. You put the cattle on the land and you can diversify and, and grow the plant community, but if you leave the cattle on too long, too hard, season long, it goes back to a monoculture. So if, if we run cattle on the same piece of ground year round, it's Kentucky bluegrass and brome grass. But if you manage it and you rotate it properly, you, do, you get that diversity and then that diversity feeds itself and brings life back into the soil and you, you just, uh, it's kind of a win-win if you can get the forbs and then all the various native grasses uh, to return to the landscape. It's been very interesting seeing this change in diversity on his on this unit. Um, we, we know that there was some flat areas that were probably farmed back in the 30s. Um, they're probably more invaded with the brome grass and the Kentucky and we know that they're going to be harder to change those species out there. But to see like the thin uplands and other areas that haven't been farmed to know that that seed's been sitting there for many, many years and just haven't had a chance to show themselves is, it's extremely impressive. And he's doing this through the proper rest and the change in time of use each year and just the timing and the, amount, the right amount of cows out there. You know, Heidi Reince and Rod Voss, they've really been doing a lot with the grazing side with, with Doug. So probably within the last few months, I've become a little more active with Doug, working on his grazing management system. And now that he's starting to get the little fire bug, a little bit on the prescribed burning, dealing with cedar trees, um, you know, trying to set back his cool season invaders, smooth brome, Kentucky bluegrass, all of that. So, you know, as Doug has mentioned, he's really big into uh, the resiliency of his rangelands. And so using, using that grazing management and that prescribed burning, he's really trying to set back that smooth brome, Kentucky bluegrass, and get them cedars out of there. The one thing that, that's been most successful to our operation is water. That south unit, when we acquired that a few years back and our flow well quit, I had already engaged with uh, the NRCS of bringing water in. And when that well quit on us, I, you know, that was the, I guess that was the, the hint that, hey, we better bring water in. So we put in a couple miles of pipeline and I think we got uh, about seven water sites and that just gave us the opportunity. Now we can put cattle wherever we want to and not worry. So water is your biggest thing. You know, if you've got water, you can move cattle anywhere. Uh, number two, uh, put in some uh, permanent uh, high tensile fencing. Then from there, it's just changing your management styles for your resource concerns. 
One thing I've noticed with Doug is he pays very close attention to what the site looks like before he puts the cows out, while they're out there, and then when they're done. And I think that's extremely important that we're getting out on the site and observing what's out there. And I think that's gonna help you make a decision for the next year. My kids now are having babies and I'm surrounded with grandchildren. I see it a huge asset to be involved in the, the ranching operation again and having my kids and my grandkids involved in that. There's a lot of value in it and when I take the, my grandchildren out across the prairie, you know, picking wildflowers or looking at various uh, forbs and grasses or riding the horses through and moving cattle, you know, they gain a lot of knowledge, a lot of life experiences from doing that and I think that's, uh, that's very important.